Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 512. That's 512 of the Agassino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking the show of your YouTube, you know what to do. Smash a like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. That will be greatly, greatly appreciated. And of course, if you listen via the podcast app, a share and obviously a re review on the podcast app, specifically or particularly, if you could spare me a five-star review, I'd greatly appreciate that to help with the algorithm, help to get me discovered and all that good stuff. I'd really, really appreciate that. And of course, support via Patreon as well. It's always appreciated at patreon.com, which is Agostino. A little as one dollar, equivalent of one pound per month. You get access to all my bonus content only available on there. So make sure you jump in board. Don't delay get involved at patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon.com for slash a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o get involved on there today don't delay i'd love to see you i'd love to see you but here we are man 512 of the show for whatever reason whenever i do these intros i always forget the number of podcasts i'm on which is maybe a good indication of how much work i'm doing and how much i'm hustling and how much i'm just pushing forward or it could be a representation of just how much my brain has deteriorated over the years i don't know one or the other one or the other but regardless we're here we keep on moving i've got a nice little beat street beach beat true beat true smoothie here that i've mixed in with a little bit of apple and some ginger and a little bit of lime to get all my immune system back up to where it needs to be look how bright red that thing is right mad in it right how red that thing is it's red as hell it tastes amazing it's punchy. That's one thing I don't like when you go to smoothie, smoothie shops in general. Or you get to health food shops. They don't, they're not really lenient with the ginger. They just give you a bit. I mean, I want myself to be punchy. I want it to open up all my sinuses. I've had sinus issues from a very long time. So, you know, any assistance I can get on that front, I'm always going to be game for it. So, yeah, always down for that sort of stuff. Always down. But, yeah, regardless of that, here we are enjoying ourselves, having fun, doing the best things we can. I'm not having fun, of course, being a United fan, seeing all the kind of fall out from the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer episode, hearing news now recently that Ronald Koeman has been sacked at Barcelona. Even though they have more points than us in the league, I think they're probably in a tougher group in the Champions League. Um, they definitely shouldn't be in a position where they sack their coach before we do. But again, we move, we move, we move. And again, for Ole, even though I'm not a big fan of his, I think it's a completely unfair position to be in. Somebody that, you know, the club says they believed in, somebody they put a lot of money into, somebody they got they gave more time than anybody post Sergis Ferguson to now put him in a situation where he has to go into a changing room where he effectively knows half of the dressing room is against him or half the dressing room thinks he's not fit for the job. Do you know what I mean? You don't necessarily need that. Of course, a lot of this is happening because we're not playing well. When we're playing well, no one's going to come out and leak stuff about his training and about the level of the coaching. No one's going to do that because when things are going well, things are going well. And obviously no one's going to listen to you either because you're just going to sound like you're moaning because you're not playing. But when stuff, 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 when stuff starts to go bad, you don't know if the leaks that are coming out are based on the people who are not performing or don't get a chance to play or are those leaks coming out on behalf of the better players, the more established players who know that their careers are coming to an end and they don't want to waste any time, you know, trying to help Oli figure it out on the job or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? That could be part of it. Who knows? So with that in mind, Oli's probably in a situation where he doesn't know who is stabbing him in the back, which is probably the worst place to be, right? It's one thing um, it's one thing being stabbed in the back and, and or stabbed in the front and knowing who did it, right? It's sort of like um, Caesar, right? When he got assassinated, um, everyone that kind of worked with him or that was once his um, ally come around and huddled around him if you believe the stories and you know essentially stabbed him a few times i think more than six or something i forgot what the number was and then he collapsed of course right and at least he knew he saw them face to face eye to eye right the people that had kind of you know essentially gone um gone behind his back you know in terms of preparation and wanted to kind of oust him as emperor right or his great rule or whatever it may be. And in this case, Oli has no idea. He doesn't know. I'm sure he has an inkling, he has a feeling of who, because there's been leaks about people, you know, confronting him at half time about certain things. So I'm sure he knows as a coach who said what, but still, it must be a weird situation to be in. But again, just another further proof. I've always said whenever it comes to my own career, I've always kind of made this assumption or I've kind of had this sort of idea that in general, 
I never felt like I was um, not qualified for a role. I never felt like I was an imposter in anything because I think for the most part, apart from real top level performance, and again, we've all been there. We've all worked in bars. We've all worked in shops. We've all worked in offices where you've worked with somebody who's absolutely amazing at their job. Doesn't matter if you've if you're worked as a bin man. You've known when you worked with somebody who's legitimately levels above you at the job that you're both doing, right? And those people do exist. But for the most part, most people we kind of interact with in our workspace or in our working career I usually just kind of, I usually just, you know, bluffing it like we are, right? They're just figuring it out on the go. They're trying to do the best they can with the resources available. They're trying to just make sure that they live day to day and put food on the table, you know, close their back and keep the lights on in their home. That's what they're trying to do. So this idea that people have that, oh, because Man United are a big club, we should be moving a certain way. I'd never believe that. I think, you know, fools and people who are not, capable of doing the job to that level existed everywhere you go to a shop sometimes somebody doesn't mark your receipt properly you can't return it somebody gives you one shoe and you order the shoe online um a store that you meant to go to you know it closes before it says it's going to close on the google thing um banks telling you you can get this loan but you go there and you don't, don't get the loan you know those little tiny things that happen they tell you like what the hell's going on who, who runs this place you know i mean why can't somebody help me or you go to a supermarket and there's no one to help assist you because they're all i don't know chatting in a corner somewhere crappy people exist at crappy people who do crappy jobs exist everywhere and i think this may United situation is clear proof that we are run by quite possibly one of the most incompetent balls that exist in the history of the world and it's quite sobering but it's also quite refreshing to know that incompetence um doesn't discriminate incompetence exists in every facet of life but you know doesn't matter who the person is it does exist so you know whatever what can we do we keep it moving we keep it moving um to update you guys well so i went out there in the weekend what i got up to I ended up going to Fabric for the 22nd birthday party there. Bit of an odd one to go to, but I guess if you're Fabric and you're a super club, you have to basically celebrate every day, every year that you're basically, um, that marks the calendar year when you actually launch or when you opened, right? It just makes sense. But usually people do like, round, like, um, you know, what would you say? Big numbers, right? Like the, like in five increments. So it's like five, ten, da, 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 da. That's what people usually do. But again, if you want to cause a bit of hype and you want to keep it going, then you're going to do it every year. So it is what it is. So yeah, went to twenty second birthday. Was lucky enough to get a guest list spot. So again, big up um, the connect for the guest list spots. I really, really appreciate that. Um, not something that I ever expect to be given in all actuality. As somebody has, who kind of committed himself to a life of nightlife, a night, uh, a life of yeah, a light, a life of nightlife escapades and dancing and other sort of you know um activities that will not be mentioned in this podcast i don't necessarily care about guest list stuff never really have to be fair usually when you go to parties and raves if you want to get behind the dj booth and look cool you can figure it out on a day it's not that hard right you just need to you know talk to the right people get pally pally befriend befriend smooch smooch offer a couple keys to somebody up a couple bumps somebody and suddenly here you are in the dj booth it's not that difficult but it is nice sometimes if you know you're going out anyway and then you have the possibility of going out to another place. And then that place also happens to be a place that, you know, charges a pretty hefty price in terms of tickets when it comes to fabric. It's nice to know that you can go there and just be able to walk into free, walk in free. And then obviously have the ability to obviously make up that money in terms of drinks, right? That's always the, the thing. Because someone like myself, I go out, you know, I have a good time. I'm not really tight in terms of spending. So if I get a free ticket, I'm definitely going to be able to use that money just to buy more drinks at the bar. It just adds to my drink, um, you know, my uh, my drink budget. So that was brilliant. Awesome. And again, from all the slander that I've said about Fabric over the years, I have to kind of really <laughs> swallow it and kind of um, take a bit of a step back in terms of what they do as an operation. Don't get me wrong. It's not perfect. There are things I don't like about the place. Clearly, I think people have kind of pointed those things out. But in terms of the scale that they run at, the amount of people that come through those doors, the amount of artists they book inside that place, for them to run on a quite consistent basis, smooth nights, get people in and out of that place 
with ease have again cloakroom issues i had i had someone at night get sorted really really quickly loads of logistical little admin things that you don't really think about until you're obviously going through the situation you just have to clap you have to really give them a lot of props like they run a very very tight operation and everybody again who i kind of had to deal with in terms of the entry ticketing kind of things was bare safe that even the security have improved over the years security before were flipping horrible they've improved to some extent it's just you know it takes a bit getting used to when you're used to going to kind of warehouse raves and places in Berlin and other kind of, you know, a bit underground type clubs to get used to being in a space where there's a million security guards with flashlights walking around the dance floor all the time, checking, making sure you're not getting up to any sort of nonsense. But once you get into the mood and once you get into the flow, you kind of forget about it. But it does take a bit of getting used to. It's just a standard thing of London, really. It's not really something that's only kind of specific to them. Or oh, let me get my camera into focus. I think it's not in focus. Is it in focus? There you go. It's not really specific only to fabric, but it is something you kind of have to think about when you do go to these kind of places. But wow, man. Wow, wow, wow. What a great night. Again, so easy to get in, easy to come out. No problem with that one. Obviously, I went um more importantly well obviously i went to go see my hero and somebody that i've always kind of looked up to in terms of djs you know him i'd say ricardo Villalobos boss is the person of course i'm mentioning um dj harvey and i'd say as just as somebody to look up to in terms of my approach to djing and stuff i'll say those two let's keep it just those two i would say for, this is a weird one to say but i'd say seth truckster just because of how he came into the game so young you know his ability um to kind of traverse different scenes obviously now he's kind of firmly in the tech house he saw stuff but he came through different sort of beats i thought a bit of minimal bit of deep obviously now he's heading more so in the tech house space but i still think he has the scope as an artist to kind of get a little bit avant-garde get a little bit weird and go in the in a way that people don't really expect but in general just in terms of being a maverick in front of the decks and being a little bit of a rock star being a little bit you know unconventional you know not wearing totally all black as you can see in the picture here Ricardo Lobos wearing his kind of signature um own neck sort of t-shirts just loungy and you know whatever maybe twiddling his little arms around but I think Ricardo's definitely always been up there for me in terms of people that I've kind of looked up to in DJ wise and obviously he's a very enigmatic figure very complex media shy and just generally a little bit of aloof um and these sets usually kind of reflect his personality especially when you kind of go on the um the certain meme pages and stuff about you know him being sweaty and maybe being drugged up behind the decks and whatnot but i think that all adds to his character that all adds to his allure and i've always kind of been a fan of seeing him at fabric i've seen him i think a couple of times there beforehand but I wanted to see him, of course, in this sort of zone, in this sort of phase of my kind of raving life where I'm a little bit more um, in tune with the nights, right? I'm not just going in there in a flipping blur of drugs and alcohol. I'm actually going in there to listen to music, hear someone play. And that was a pleasure to hear him play back to back with Craig Richards. Um, there were moments in his set where he was clanging all over the place, right? But that was, again, it's the charm of Ricardo. It's more so the selection. It's similar to like a dj harvey you don't go to dj harvey to listen to him mix like you know seamlessly like you would a dixon or something right you go there to hear him basically or to hear he's not going to juggle three decks like a devious one right but you go there to hear selection to hear the way he kind of you know curates the room um the way he kind of shapes the room twos and throws all that kind of stuff and you saw that really Ricardo. i think i had a couple of chats with people on the dance floor too they said the same thing they're like guys oh, clanging and shit but i don't care this is fucking amazing right hearing this sort of music play in this sort of system you know tracks that are running like 15 minutes long and shit like mad absolutely mad situation so i loved it loved every minute of it um pick up the guy too taking pictures spoke to him briefly as i was standing on the side here trying to record a sneaky video um of D ricardo dj and couldn't really get much of it anyway to be honest because it's absolutely dark as hell in there it's not really great for recording i have to be completely fair um which is a good sign for them but the guy that took the pictures here the pictures look absolutely incredible gotta be honest let's read the caption actually with ricardo the caption says 22 years on the chatter on the Ch carter so i said charter house street a few days have passed since the euphoric closing moments of our birthday we've had time to reflect and appreciate what a truly glorious time it was and also how lucky we are to be dancing with you still after all these years we wouldn't have got this far without you all huge thank you all to everyone who took part of the weekend and to everyone that has passed through our doors in the past 22 years old friends new friends global friends they're all on the dance floor you showed us the magic that unfolds when our literary community come together 
Thank you to all the artists too. Every single one of them put your outstanding performances, good vibes continuously start to, from finish for your energy, your support, your love. Thank you always to 22 more fabric. And yeah, wish them 22 more. Honestly, they definitely deserve it, man. They absolutely smashed it. Like it was a great night, great, great curation. Um, I missed quite a few good DJs on the Saturday day, on the Sunday day, and obviously the whole of Saturday. But, you know, I was working. I didn't really have time to go. So as soon as I finished, I was able to kind of pop over and see Ricardo play. And I was, again, in fact, trade with the whole thing it was just incredible i actually walked in first and i went upstairs to room three to go and see um cormac play an incredibly good disco set um stayed for about an hour there dancing my absolute face off with absolutely sublime set so again big up cormac he was absolutely bossing room three didn't even know there was a room three actually until i got in there um that's again dummy dummy me i think maybe i might, might be a new space not too sure because i'm only usually I only usually traverse between one and two. Um, bump into a couple of good lads as well. People that maybe will be in Berlin at the same time I'm around. So that was nice. Um, and just generally a good vibe. The only thing that was a bit of a shit sh stain on it was, of course, my tendency to lose things. And secondly, I went to the green room. And I have to be honest, right? A green room in a club, which I've been to a couple, but not a lot. Because I don't really, you know, tend to care about those kind of things getting behind DJ booths and stuff I've never understood that again maybe because I'm a club kid and I DJ myself I never really got the allure of people standing behind the decks and like acting cool I always think that's a bit lame and I never also got the allure of just being a punter and wanting to go to a green room I never really got the point of it again like I said I would much rather be able to get a guest list to go into a rave and just dance my face off and drink loads than you know want to beg to get somebody to get me in a green room I don't really understand it but let's just say the green room of any nightclub that you would imagine in your head is exactly how it is, but it's even worse than what you'd imagine. Um, I walk into the green room of Fabric and the people in there were, oh, I, I, I don't think I've experienced a more colder reception or welcome into a room ever in my entire life. It's my raving experience life. They were, and again, I would just describe myself as a quite of a extroverted person, right? I try to make people um, comfortable when I'm around. I try my best to make people like me, right? I have that kind of weird tick as well. I want people to like me and stuff. And I instantly felt like a vibe of like, what the fuck is this guy doing here? Who the hell is this? Like the eyes were just mad, innit? Um, the only people that were lovely were the actually guy that was showing me around. I wish I forgot, wish I remember his name. It was like a Baz Shalaz, something along those kind of lines. That guy was an absolute gent. Um, whoever that dude was, I forgot his name. He was helping me to find some stuff and a few of the other guys I met in the back back of the green room but I had to get out there quickly you know what I mean I couldn't stay there any longer because those guys were an absolute oh that vibe was terrible um and again there is something weird about somebody that want to go to a nightclub and sit in a green room I understand maybe going in there when the DJ's there so you can shoot the shit I don't know talk I don't know you know, fan fanboy or fan girl out, get a couple of quick selfies. I don't know. But going to a party and just wanting to go into a green room is really bizarre. Unless you just want to go there just to do drugs or something of that kind of ilk. I understand. Cool. Do your thing. But if you just want to go just to stand in there, because again, the, the fabric green room isn't near any of the flipping decks or anything. It's right in the middle of the flipping two rooms, I think, for the most part. So you don't really hear much of the music. Um, it kind of takes away from experience. And again, with their sound system, with how dark it is and the way things reverberate around those rooms you want to be in right in front of the decks like how i was for the majority of that night whether it was in room two room one or room three i was right in front of those decks so that was great but again that's a story for another day but big up everybody there included um again um, I had a great time, enjoyed it. Uh, I can't say any bad words about it. Let's quickly scan through the pictures. You got a picture of Ricardo. I'm not sure who that is. That's Seth Troxler. A picture of the crowd. Um, you got a picture here. I don't know who that is. Getting the spud. You got Cormac, of course, who I saw play in room three. He was absolutely sensational. Again, pick up Cormac. Like, great, great disco set. Like, I, but disco, I think there's a little bit of Italo, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not getting too, if I wasn't too high, then I'm sure there was some Italian disco being played there too. Absolutely marvellous set. I met a couple of people, a couple of girls at the front. Had an absolute barnstorming night, dancing with them, having a little boogie, sharing a couple high fives and spuds. And again, that's the one thing I would say about raving now. Even though I still think the attendances in parties is way down than what it was 
pre-pandemic, right? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, like I mentioned in the previous podcast, even though we like to kind of turn up our nose at them, I think the lack of Italian, Spanish and French and maybe somewhat German tourists or maybe even you know, people from the Holland, Netherlands, people maybe from Scandinavia, that kind of part of Europe, with with the lack of those tourists coming over and maybe them staying home and being more home-based or going back home if they were living here, I think it's definitely affected club space and attendances, you know, negatively here in London. But the flip side is that when people do go out, they are so on having a good time. Like, I don't think I've ever, again, apart from the green room, that was an absolute vibe killer. But again, those people that sit in the green room in a nightclub are a different breed of people. Everyone I've met on a dance floor in any club I've been to, again, I've been to a few this, you know, post lockdown, you know, in terms of scale. Um, I've been to 200 places, I've been to 500 capacity, I've been to 1000, I've been to all these kind of good places where you can kind of gauge what's going on. I don't think I've been to a single party where the vibe hasn't been good. Maybe my vibe hasn't been good going in, but I've not been in the place where their vibe itself on the dance floor has not been good. Everyone's really up for it. So I think this is maybe, if you again, if you're on the fence about Fabric and you've, you've heard about the bad reputation like I have over the years, this is maybe the best time to go to a place like Fabric. Like legitimately, like this is the best time to go. Like this is such a fun place. It really, really is such a fun place to go. Everyone's having a good time. And again, I love it because it's a bit more of a, it's not, weird to say this but it's a bit more of a mature crowd let's say so you're not kind of combating with a group of 19 year olds you know on their first ketmish we can always be a bit weird so that's always quite nice but i also do like sometimes when they have those kind of younger nights that there is that kind of split right there is that kind of difference there is that kind of mood and because they've got the chairs people can sit down have a laugh listen to music and just keep it moving man it's all such a great vibe i'm not going to lie um don't know who that is who's this singing on the mic that's Josh Caf Josh Cafe. Another shot of people in room three again. That room three is pretty is banging in it. It's so you know what room three reminds me of? It reminds me of a little bit of like plastic people. I don't know if you guys remember this legendary club in Shoreditch on Curtain Road. Um legendary club i think it might have been like 200 people 150 people max that fit in there and it was an absolute sweat box and you're right back up you're right like bang in front of the dj and they have like a little perspex glass thing that sort of went that way back into the dj they sort of covered them but you were right back up into them. sometimes someone played vinyl you know the heat would basically warp the flipping vinyl or make this needle skip and you bumping next to it or make it skip as well so it just added to the old texture of the night it was absolutely nuts it kind of reminds me a little bit of plastic people that vibe obviously it's got higher ceilings and stuff so it's not as, as kind of intimate and dark but it's still a great use of space i'm not gonna lie um oh that's rod had again playing i think in room two does that look like it's from that's room two at the top of the balcony bit that room two how that specked out especially when you look at it from the front in from the back all the way through is just banging it looks like a cathedral a cathedral of techno and pain yeah obviously the real craig rich is here playing as well uh, earlier i think maybe this was what back back with ricardo again he held the fort craig, big up craig richards whenever ricardo would clang the hell out of the place craig richards would come in and just kind of save the night i mean he was hold he was the glue that held that set together but again i think they go off each other they kind of sorry they um they work off each other really well they've been you know that they've been playing together f for many many years so i'm sure they know how to like you know pick up on their energies and go here go there whatever it may be so yeah big up everyone involved in fabric i feel honestly legitimately a decent 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 night um but 20 you know anniversary parties are a bit weird in general to go to sometimes they can attract a weird crowd but i thought this was one of the better ones i've been to and again it's kind of made me reappreciate and maybe fall back in love with fabric in general as a venue again that's the room two with Cormac that was in so again i appreciate those guys for doing that in that respect and just yeah just a great night man i really enjoyed it and again pick up ricardo an absolute legend i'm um, to see him again i really want to see ricardo hustle dj harvey dj harvey who i'm a i'm a fanatic about seen him play you know many 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 places follow him around the country and shit but i remember once seeing him play at Bergheim, right so i specifically went specifically went to Bergheim to go see him play and he was listed that he was going to play Bergheim. that's how mad it was it wasn't even he was listed to play in panorama bar which makes more sense because that's the more housey sort of kind of place right housey disco thing and he absolutely tore Bergheim a new one like he tore it a new one and it was fantastic to see a dj who you kind of think in your head is more alternative disco you know whatever paradise garage whatever that sound is right that kind of it can go anywhere from like prog rock to like new wave to indie dance to new disco whatever right but you wouldn't think he would be Bergheim 
material, right? You wouldn't think that would be his place that he would also play, but he did, and he absolutely killed it. And I would love to see Ricardo playing something similar, whether even it's not a burger, even it's like a fold, or he's like he's playing at like an Ismus, or he's playing at like a Heran, however you pronounce it, Heran, so it's like a sign, or one of those really classic techno parties, and he just plays there. I would just love to see, I really would. Um, I don't think he would play that sort of stuff, but it'd be great to see regardless. But yeah, big up everybody, loved it. Fair because of vibe 22 year anniversary and like the caption said hoping for 22 more years from these men let's get the camera focused cool move on next good news here we have actual good news from um the festival circuit we have news courtesy of junction regarding their new party they're going to be putting on junction two festival is happening finally um in 2022 many delays in between they're basically the first one i think in three years i went to the last one before it could before the pandemic so that's actually a good thing to remember like in your head right to kind of have that memory of like oh it was really amazing the last time i went and that's the one memory you have to hold on to which is awesome going forward um obviously they've got a lot to kind of you know um aim for in terms of the how good that first one was because you know that good that first one was just too good but i think considering the the pause and considering how many people have been fiending for this festival to come back i think they'll do a good job and again crank brothers are um easily one of our better promoters when it comes to putting any sort of things right i think it's crank brothers that put do this so i'm pretty sure it's crank brothers and lwe right or am i mistaken okay cool it doesn't matter Anyway, for the Junction 2 Festival, it says here, Jubilee Bank Holiday Weekend, Friday the 3rd and Saturday the 4th of June 2022. Full lineup has been announced. The Friday lineup is great and the Saturday lineup is even better. I want to say for everybody that complains about gendered lineups, that complains about people not getting highlighted who are maybe underground or maybe not as well known or kind of in that sort of like middle to lower middle tier of DJs who not that, you know, again, maybe can't sell out a, a fold on your own back and hold down a cause or hold down a fold and maybe with a fill a lineup sort of thing. Let's give Junction 2 props for at least providing a real contrast in terms of people who are playing on the Friday and the Saturday. I'd say the Saturday is definitely more business techno and the Friday is definitely more for the heads. So let's give them props because a lot of these festivals don't do these sort of things or don't make their lineups diverse, don't make them, you know, don't, don't have, you know, forget diversity, variety more so. But I think all these people deserve to be in this lineup and they're going to all smash it. And I think it's a, it's a testament against Junction 2 for being a little bit forward thinking in how they approach festivals you know the location the sound the organization everything how it's produced it's just all really really high level so it's no surprise that they would go this direction with the festival and i'm hoping the same people that complain about lineups same people that complain about representation are going to buy tickets to this thing and sell it out on a friday as the saturday is probably going to be sold out we know that already because of the names listed but i hope the friday sells out at the same level because you can't beg for these things and then when they come on sale you don't go or you don't buy tickets do you know what i mean that's not going to be a great way to kind of um let these promoters know that what you're pushing for is what people actually want because of course we know the honest truth of the conversation is that the people that some people push for in terms of variety and you know moving things forwards aren't necessarily the people that sell tickets so the promoters are in a tough position because effectively to throw a party and to make it worthwhile you need to sell tickets you need to be able to recruit something i was a promoter and for the most part when i did it i just wanted to make sure i broke even i just wanted to make sure whatever i spent i got back that's it i don't care about whatever profit happens on top that's just a bonus but just make sure that i put in the party and i'm not going to the red more often than not though you do go into the red so it'll be great if now especially considering it's been three years or two years whatever it's been people can go out buy tickets for the friday as well as the saturday because again like i said the saturday is definitely going to sell out and let them know that hey we want these sort of lineups this is what we want going forward but anyway moving on the lineup itself on friday is as follows uh friday you on the third of june you have ans who i've profiled on this podcast before somebody who i saw play at that boiler room thing for the first time alongside the blessed madonna and somebody else so it should be great to see her play live i'm really looking forward to that aurora halal avalon emerson's always good but nobo carlotta seri chaos in the cbd crombie that'd be great berlin based but i think he's from uk somewhere in ireland or something so i'd be great to see him dmx crew live eclair fifi of course scottish she'll be good to see somebody play like that here fes 
Vanessa, Fatima Yamaha live forte. Again, a little bit of a tired booking in terms of London festivals, but in terms of him bringing it to the kind of stage, he's going to be great. Hessel Audio Trio, you already know that vibe is going to be sick. John Hopkins, you already know that's going to be good. Um, Jordan Nocturne, Jossie Mitsu, Leon Va Leon Vinehall, again, you already know that's going to be sick. Midland, you don't need to talk about that. All going to be sick. Nina Kravitz booking on the Friday is a bit weird, but again, for the Friday, you need maybe one marquee kind of booking just to bring people in. Not really interested in seeing her in that place. Octa, Octa, back to back to Erish Drew. That's going to be an absolute certainty in terms of seeing if you're not seeing those two play back to back house sets like just incredible high octane high energy is going to be blessed peach has seen a couple of her streams she should be good to see live um rival consoles runs uh terry z back to back with d tiffany if i'm not too sure if that's i tell a person from whore if i'm not too sure so rosie again i, I think it's irish right so I was, like I think she's like a ginger woman i saw her play in a horror as well again mistake don't please forgive me if i'm not right skin mask again but back with zenka brothers i'll be sick good good techno tasha tasker willow yusu and zuzu of course so banging lineup got a few on my list i'm gonna go see saturday you know already know what the vibe is 999 um adam Bayer, adele emily lenz you know get the fuck out of here and i start to christensen top girl definitely will check that out anna avalon emerson ben clock berkine um the resident there benjamin damage bean blau one i'll be sick Bramman ham dax j dina um dina abdul abdul -Oweed. Abda Abdel Wahid. That's how you say it, right? Abdel Wahid. Um Dent and Pika. Dixon, of course. You already know the vibes in it. Dixon fanboy crew here. Number one uh, fanboy in the world. So definitely gonna see him. DJ Boring live. Oh, DJ Boring's doing a live set. Interesting. The Do Do Dr. Rubenstein amazing booking e dancer francella francesco delgada franco harper Fumia Tanaka, Joe Mule, Kara Sucro, Cobolsi interesting booking Masio Plex Margaret Day it's a really interesting mix on even on Saturday but again it's still kind of similar isn't it like you know a bit more business techno Mind against Omar Richie Horton Robert Hood Live Robert Odell Roy Perez Sam Banogo um, Samuel Deep Seth Troxa Sugar Tree Tia Nasser and Truma I would love to have seen um, Roy Perez and Dr. Riverside play back to back a little bit but I'm sure maybe because they're in London it depends on it because bookings when you book those big DJs sometimes they don't let you play in the same city on the same weekend didn't it so I don't know it'd be good to see them play somewhere back to back uh, but yeah whatever Joseph 2 Festival returns to London for the first time since 2019 madness isn't it Jubilee Bank holiday weekend Friday the 3rd 12 to 10 p.m and again like I said easily one of the best London festivals out I think just in terms of how it's produced in terms of the volume again the volume if you've been to London festivals you know they're so hit and miss when it comes to sound because of the flipping noise pollution laws and whatnot in local residents and some of the parks are usually in densely populated residential areas so you know counter people kick up a fuss at residents residents keep up a fuss which is again understandable but it doesn't make for good parties but because junction's legitimately under a motorway um there's nothing near it they can just absolutely blast the music even the, the bit under the motorway the, i don't know what that stage is called that's probably got some of the best sounds like, because of the concrete you know and the acoustics that way but it's fucking sick man legitimately sick i really recommend you going if you're a fan of festivals in general if you're not then i don't know what to tell you Joseph 2 finally returns to London. It says here for the first time since 2019 on one of the most anticipated events of 2022. Definitely agree. Taking place across Jubilee Bank Holiday Weekend on Friday the 3rd and Saturday the 4th of June. Many industry sought after figures. Rising stars will perform across numerous bespoke stages. At an event that has always put community at the core, Junction 2 has embraced innovation, new technologies and creative thinking to explore the relationship between sonic experience, surrounding environment that way we engage with culture. So we proudly present for the 22, for the 2022 22 edition the focus of rebirth at junction 2 finally delivers this festival in three years its first in three years despite being unable to host a festival in a traditional format for the past two summers we have used the time to expand the project into new directions 2022 saw the spirit of boston manor brought to life with j2v uk's first large-scale underground virtual festival and in january 2021 we pushed the digital technology to its edges with junction 2 connections uh, bringing together three iconic music cities detroit berlin london under the virtual roof and a forgettable 48 hour in a city takeover a tobacco dock and fabric ensued on bank holiday weekend yeah they've done a lot to be fair they've done a lot in terms of pushing things forward friday but yeah looking forward to it man 
Cannot wait. It's going to be absolute barnstorm and event. Like, look at that view from the DJ. Imagine how sick that must be to play somewhere and see that when you're playing out. God damn. Um, absolute bad man. But yeah, big up Junction. Can't wait to go. Junction 2 happening very, very soon. Very, very, very soon. Okay. Um, what else we have here? Oh, we've got good news for me, courtesy of the BBC. COVID travellers now able to use cheaper COVID tests going forward for trips, which is banging. It says new rules are allowing travellers returning to England to take lateral flow tests instead of more expensive PCR tests have come into force. Fully vaccinated people arriving from non-red list countries can now use lateral flow tests on or before the day of their return, which is great because usually the day to return, you have to book a PCR test, which are usually a lot more expensive than the lateral flow test because they're meant to be a lot more accurate. Um, they require you to send back your results to the lab and whatnot. OG lateral flow tests, you just you know do little drops on the thing. Wales will make the same change a week, uh, later this week. Scotland and Northern Ireland have identified, ad indicated they may also follow suit. Before then, anyone travelling in the UK, everyone travelling on, everyone travelling on to the other UK nations in the 10 days of arrival in England must follow the rules of testing quarantine. The latest change in travel rules in England come into time for many families going on half-time holidays. Lateral flow tests is re um, for returning travellers must be brought from private providers NHS kits cannot be used oh damn okay cool and private is listed on the government website starting at 19 pounds that's a bit of annoying isn't it so you can't use the NHS ones you have to use okay so you still have to pay but I guess you still you have the benefit now just doing it at home and getting instant results not having to wait around no problem passengers need to book these tests before traveling to the UK they must send a picture of their natural flow test to verify the result and fail to do so could result in a final one thousand dollars one thousand pounds sorry the change also applies to under 18 to live in the UK travelers will still need to complete a passenger locator form before they return the Department of Health said that anyone who tested positive would have to take a PCR test which they could get free for the inner chest so you pay for the lateral flow and if you need it you get pcr for free cool health secretary sajid david said i'm delighted that um from today eligible travelers to england will have would have had a life-saving covid vaccine can benefit from cheaper lateral flow tests providing they fast results the huge boost of the travel industry and the public will make it easier and cheaper for people to book holidays and travel abroad and that's always been the point why i got the vaccine it was never because of some stance or because i thought the vaccine was going to protect me from covid it probably isn't you, you know as many stories people still getting it now it's you know whatever but i just wanted to have the ability to be able to travel especially for the things that i'm into for the profession that i have there's a possibility that i could be djing in in berlin in Nova, in december sometime right and if that's the case i'm going to have the i need the ability to be able to travel back and forth on a frequent basis i'm going to other parts of england and shit there might be other european stuff coming up in, in a new year so i need to have that ability to move around and again i like traveling so that's basically the reason why i did it and if i can save money on top of it and i can save stress then of course i'm going to do so so yeah definitely looking forward to that a great 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 um update um Let's continue here. Dr. Jenny Harris, Chief Executive of the UK Health Sec Security Agency, said it was critical that people with positive lateral toe tests get this checked with the NHS PCR. It says this way we can continue to monitor new variants and stay on top of the virus since October 4th. Fully vaccinated passengers traveling to the UK from any non registered country no longer have to take COVID tests before setting off. And people who are not fully vaccinated and over 18 still have to self isolate for 10 days after arrival in the UK. So, yeah great news for everybody in the uk i'm sure most of us are over the moon at that i know i am i know i am what else we going to talk about here um da, 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 da. let's move on from that one we talk about this yeah, let's go straight into this stuff let's go into some fashion stuff so this is courtesy of Hypebeast. It says here is a preview of the Off-White and Nike Air Force One mids that are due to come out. So I think most people are aware or most people would mind and would sense new that the collaborations between Virgil and Nike were never going to stop anytime soon. Nike have kind of lucked out with Virgil because he essentially is a bit of a workhorse. Um, he loves to be busy. He loves to collaborate. And if you're someone like Nike and, you know, most of your kind of um, bigger releases are coming from collaborations, um, then you're going to be exp you're going to be trying to squeeze as much as you can out of a creative like Virgil because he's willing to do the job as well. Because I'm sure, you know, getting a Nike deal and having a collaboration is one thing, but doing the work must be a bit much, especially if you've got your own brand going. Usually that's what happens, right? If you've got your own popping brand, 
Nike come up to you or you get the opportunity to go to them and pitch something it's mutually beneficial but you've got a lot of stuff going on right you've got your own brand to look after a store an agency whatever it may be so it takes a lot of time so after the first one you might be like you know what i'm kind of done for a bit i need to have a bit of a rest and maybe focus on my thing maybe the attention you got from the nike collab is increase your sales you need to double down on that whatever it may be but usually you know you have to kind of well, you have to know where your bread is buttered, right? Look after home base. So not a lot of people would keep on doing their colors because you just don't have the time to do so. But again, like I said, you know, Virgil is probably the the greatest multi hyphenate, you know, in the history of the game. So it makes sense why he kind of continually keep going with it. And he essentially, to be completely honest too, even though I'm not the biggest fan of these, I still think he has a fresh outlook when it comes to collaborations that would lend itself to doing many especially with nike when it comes to the models that he picks they just make sense and this is a nike air force one mid classic you know air force one shape it's funny because when i was growing up there was a thing about people wearing mids it was kind of looked at as like a cheaper sort of like a not cheap like a faker version of a high or a low like you've got the low or you got the high when i was growing up so a lot of the kind of um uk garage sort of like um I guess I guess you'd call them UK UK garage trappers, right? Or the kind of the guys that got money back in the day that had like the massive chaps, right? The gold chaps, the gold tooth, who drove, who rode motorbikes and stuff, and you know, um, superbikes. Sorry, no motorbikes, superbikes. Who drove Lexuses and shit and had Versace shirts. They'd always wear Air Force One highs or lows. It was never mids. And only when I got a bit older and I started to buy my own shoes, that suddenly mids became a thing in school. People would buy all black mids or white mids to wear on maybe non school uniform day. But when I was growing up young, young, it was never a vibe. But nowadays, of course, you know, people love mids, people love highs. Um, they are what they are. Air Force Ones are kind of a classic shape. And again, like I've always said, they're definitely one of my top three sneakers of all time. Top three sneakers would always be um Air Jordan Four the Jordan Four, um, the Air Force One and the MX ninety. Those are my top three sneakers of all time. Like I could wear any of those pairs of shoes and be good for the end of time. So it's good to see Virgil doing an Air Force One. Uh, again a mid, a flip on it. There's loads of interesting DLs you can see here that again would make it a bit of a fresh idea to come in on the market it's also funny that i think someone pointed out on twitter too because i saw the original picture whoever leaked this um took the picture with their hand you know, and took it in front of some weird barb wired sort of thing but then every sort of blog that then picked it up basically you know did chucked it in photoshop and did the old black background um edit and took away his hand and the background and all sorts of things so he doesn't even get any credit for the picture that he basically leaked but you know the game is the game so from what we can see, it sort of looks like a weird kind of fly wire type material. I don't think it is. There's camo sort of streaks on the inside. You've got a translucent, in, you've got a translucent swoosh. You've got the same translucent sort of material webbed on the back of the strap that goes leads all the way down to the mud guard. You've got this interesting plastic heel cup that you don't get on normal Air Force One. Maybe this is inside out though, because maybe this heel cap you get when your shoe it's inside your shoe that you don't see when you're wearing it so it maybe flipped it on the inside not too sure he's obviously got the cable ties here the signature that he has on his own shoes but interestingly enough the cable ties are just laces this time they're not actual like you know pulley sort of lacy things it looks like you've got a little tail tab here at the back which you don't get on air force ones a little let a little loop to put it through you've got this weird sort of wavy pattern on the midsole that kind of blends in a little bit with these weird kind of ripples um you've got a rendition of a waffle sole here on the classic nike runner on the toe and on the midfoot of the sneaker which i'm not too sure what that's about maybe it's a performance thing who knows um but yeah interesting makeup like i like the makeup of it i think in different colors it's going to look absolutely insane imagine this in the black obviously uh, virgil's signature sort of black with silver swoosh is going to look bad like insanely good um obviously imagine a silver swoosh and it's sort of like translucent -y material i'm not sure how that's going to be applied actually i wonder how you'd color something like this it's sort of like a polyurethane also what's that what's that plastic called we used to use it in school when we would kind of make stuff in dt i forgot but it's very flexible it can somehow sometimes come opaque but it's also can come colored but i wonder how you'd get that sort of chromey finish that he likes when he swoosh on there i don't know i'm not really too sure but again i love the i love the design of it i love that it's sort of flipped inside out um there's different little bits on here in terms of how it's been constructed on the upper the lace loops are entirely different to what you'd expect on an air force one they've sort of got the lace loops that you get on uh oh what's the shoe that did this 
it's not a laha, but it's sort of like that kind of style of a laha and something on like the ATG where the lace loops are sort of on the inside and they go like that, like a like a like a number eight on the inside, right? Instead of how you do them with the lace loops on the side in terms of here. So that's an interesting flip on them. But again, interested to see more colorways. Definitely will see them very soon. Now that the leaks have come out, you know, nothing stays secret when it comes to Nike. They're in their case basically incapable of keeping anything behind um, closed doors or close to their chest because people just love the brand too much and want to let everybody know what they've seen and heard. Um, people are quick to gossip about stuff that they've heard about Nike. And so, so it's literally impossible to keep that under wraps. But let's read some of the text. It says here, Virgil Abloh was a pan, has a penchant for taking a classic Nike um, the, 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 or Jordan silhouette and flipping its appearance in a way that still keeps the elements of its iconic heritage but shows off its unique design language. And just before his forthcoming Jordan 2 collaboration, which I think looked pretty cool with the pre crumbled midsole, make their into the, way into the market. The luxury streetwear designer is already previewing more of his come, um, one of his piece being the off white and Air Force One mid. As of now, we only have a single advantage point of the kicks with medial side but we already see the shoes are jam-packed with interesting details call the corrida we've seen it missiles have been given the duh, 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 duh. No release date is service at this time, but you can likely expect more information around this to pop up in the coming months. Let's see what the comments say, actually, because, again, I'm, I'm a fan of what Virgil does with Nike. I think, like I said, it's a marriage made in heaven. I don't think everyone can collaborate to this level of turnaround as much as he can. And also the fact that he kind of takes really unconventional approach. Because I think if he was just designing colorways, this would have died a long time ago. But the fact that he's able to kind of take classic silhouettes like the text pointed out and flip them, right, whether it's flip them inside out, outside in, change change the insoles, change the midsoles, change how the laces work, like all these little clever little things. It really kind of adds and gives the collaborations an extra sort of umph. Then it would just be doing straight collab, just doing straight um, colorway changes. Um, even the Air Force Ones, you know I mean, they've got little details that kind of make them a bit more interesting than the classic Air Force One. Maybe that goes back to his little design ethos about the 3% raw or something, right? But let's see what they said. Um, the comments, Virgil is the island boy of fashion, trolling on purpose and it works. Um, but that's the thing, is it really trolling when you're able to sell these things to general customers and shit? It's not really trolling. It's just a different approach to designing shoes. But I guess, you know, when you have people making, when you have the conventional sort of sneaker designers like Pata and Clot, and then you have this, I can understand why it kind of can look a bit abrasive and sort of look like he's taking a piss, right? When you think of those kind of classic guys, right? Like the soul boxes, um, um, even the Slam City skates, like people that just do classic undefeated, right? Um, people that do classic collaborations or just make, you know, take, take classic models and sort of flip them a little bit, but not too crazy. You know, nothing that you kind of make you want to question your love for the brand or love for the sneaker model itself. But it continues. Um, another comment says here, on that note, I'm done with the internet for today. Someone says here, what in the hell is going on with the soul? Is that bad Photoshop? Is it disintegrating? The more you look at it, the better it gets. The stitching on the strap, the shoelace is tangled up in some Apple headphones. How can anyone defend the shoe? Okay. This look is, um, uh, this looks like those MMMH sneakers with melted soles. I don't know what that is. And um, what the fuck is going on with these? Like Virgil is just pointing at random stuff and it shows. It looks like so whack and devoid of functionality. And it's not even an any Aerosol Hue acronym stuff that looks forward, um, looking forward thinking and cool after mm, let's not think that that Aerosol Hue Air Force One people talk a lot of smack about it now but it didn't sell out instantly people were kind of on the fence about it until people would swag side wearing them people didn't start saying oh no they look actually quite good people were a bit on the fence so even the Prestos that came out later they took a long time to sell so not everyone that does forward figure stuff stuff sells and also this idea that you're meant to have functional trainers like if you want a functional trainer go get a running shoe go get something you can hike in sneakers lifestyle things are not meant to function they're just meant to floss and to drip in yes some this might be some elements in it that are functional but for the most part they're not designed for you to go hiking in it's designed for you to kind of go to Paris fashion week and you know stunt on all the all, all the all the n-words that you see out there those legit look terrible. Virgil doesn't know off white. Doesn't own off white anymore, and it shows. What? What's that? That's a weird thing to say. Um, he's never owned off white entirely, though. Isn't it? It's always been a kind of joint thing with New Guards Group, if I'm not mistaken. Has he sold his stake in it? Maybe he has. I don't see. It. It's a weird comment. Um. Oh my God, what's happening? It doesn't even like Air Force Ones. It doesn't even look like an Air Force One. Yeah, it does. It looks like an Air Force One. It looks conventional. Um. What the? Reimagine literally. Um, the word of 2021 I'm currently done with fashion 
Is reimagining the word of 2021? Yeah, maybe it is because sustainability was definitely the word of 2020. Now, definitely reimagine might be still crazy to me that something this hideous won't be hitting outlets by reselling for multiple times. Um, but this is the thing do you honestly think if this was made by a random store that it wouldn't resell for high amounts or it wouldn't sell out? It's an interesting inter interpretation of an Air Force One, don't you think? I think it'll do pretty well. Um, and also, there's no way of telling what sells out and what doesn't. Some things just don't hit well. Some things do. Depend. It doesn't really make sense, really, the resale market for the most part. There are some brands you can kind of count on, Supreme being one of them, undefeated nowadays, especially with their kind of um, record with Jordans, maybe. But there's no guarantee. Most certainly, I don't want the bait. Um, the, the, this reminds me of the Family Guy episode with the Quagmires, the real estate guy. <laughs> Anyone can sell you a dream home but it takes a real time to sell you junk okay well i guess the conventional ones they would have wanted were these so i guess whatever we see in these so i guess these kind of mock-ups that we saw are basically what we see up up, up top but because we just see color codes we just assume it's just going to be a classic air force one when instead it's always going to be something similar to this so maybe that's what we end up seeing but i think i think the above right the above, which you see here, come on, load up my screen. This sort of makeup of a shoe with the white and the webbing and all this sort of stuff and the reinforced thing and the transition sole, duh, 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 done in the classic sort of Air Force One colorways and like the, you know, flossing all white and the uh, might rub your home all black. I think they're still going to work really well, personally. But again, no release date. Um, Everyone kind of complaining about them is going to be the same like every other shoe Virgil puts out. People complain. People say shit. It still sells out. It resells for bears. And it just keeps moving in it. But yeah. What do I do? Next on the list here, we have some other news. Again, banging sneaker collaboration news courtesy of Hypebeast says release info for Pat and Nike's Pata and Nike Air Max's Noise Aqua collaboration, right? And obviously the other ones came out before the orangey sort of kind of color. Why is it orange? What do you call them? Our orange or what were they called? Monarch, right? The Monarch pair came out recently. Again, expertly done. Um, the application of the slightly dyed sole, the wavy mud guard, the swoosh on the mud guard, the sort of silvery mesh on the toe box, and all the other bits of mesh kind of harken back to the early 90s and stuff. The tracks were even they've designed for it. Look, it just looks incredible. Legitimately one of the best collaborations this year. It might be the best one, which is no surprise, again, considering Pat's kind of history um, in the sneaky game, considering the people that still run the, the, the store, so run the brand itself. They really care about sneakers. Their sneakers are the core. They're, they're like... They're my type of sneakerheads, the ones I grew up with on like Crooked Tongues Forum, where basically the name of the game wasn't always just to buy the most expensive shoe. The name of the game wasn't always to buy the most loudest colorway, like a what the dunk sort of type of vibe or a year the dog sort of thing. The name of the game was to kind of get a hold of vintage shoes, retro shoes, or maybe yourself kind of bring back a shoe that was basically out of love or people didn't really care for. And you basically stamped your mark on it and said, no, nah, this shoe is going to be the next thing. You bought it, you showed it off in your fit people got excited about it and all of a sudden you single-handedly on a tiny forum somewhere increased the value of it exponentially do you know what I mean too much so much to the point where people started talking to brands about bringing it back and suddenly the shoe comes back I can think of one failure of that I think it being the Air Max Lite with Nike you know that was probably one of the worst retros to ever grace the shelves of sneaker stores especially when you compare it to the vintage um um, ones people were getting from back in the day and they were kind of resoling and then Nike went out and retro the shoe and it was absolutely garbage the tooling on it was terrible um construction was horrible it just looked nothing like the actual vintage shoe you had so a lot of people then decided to back off you know um trying to hype up vintage shoes too much because they didn't want to be damaged and burnt with those sort of shoes it happened a little bit with the structure but they, i thought they were pretty decent but just in general it feels like recently Nike have finally decided to wake up because again the shape from of this shoe from the top down I don't like the lacing again I have a big pet peeve of people taking product shots and not getting the lacing correct but again we move but that aside the fact that there's no sort of like mass amount of stuffing in it and it just looks sleek 
it looks like it doesn't have that weird banana toe thing here in the front if you can tell here in the mud guard usually the actual retro zone mx one's always kind of terrible there and it just looks amazing it looks like something that you would pull out from one of those vintage nike adverts right or magazines or catalogs where you'd see somebody running in them or doing some kettlebell swings in them and they just look brilliant and then i also like the little slight addition of the plum sort of purple leather colorway at the back that they just left in there just to kind of give the heads a little heads up on what may be coming in the future um so far from what i've seen on instagram this mud guard is kind of similar to the monarch sort of one sort of like a new bucky tough suede sort of thing and then oddly enough this sort of center panel here paneling just behind the swoosh is like a tumble the leather sort of vibe so it just looks lush it looks absolutely it actually looks expensive that's the thing that i actually like about it is that it actually looks like it's a collaboration even though it's not like plastered with stuff all over it you could tell it's something a little bit different than what you'd maybe pick up from like a regular store so definitely pick these up these guys man it's just incredibly well done um so happy that they put another colorway out so i was going to be a bit bummed if it's just going to be the one monarch it's also good to see that they're not reselling for millions of bucks online because i guess no one famous has wore them yet that's just let's just be honest the moment a famous person like travis scott or asap rocky wears them the value will just kind of jump exponentially but the fact that they've just kind of been a bit of a sneaker head type of shoe has really helped someone like myself who maybe didn't get them on release date to maybe buy them later on down the line on StockX when i kind of save up for them so I'm definitely looking forward to getting a pair and I can actually envision getting a pair. I'm not a fan of the chain, you know, wearing that sort of stuff is enough as hell. But again, for the kids, if you want to do that, do your thing. Because I was never the kid, I even got the Nike swoosh. I never had that too. I always thought that was weird when people got that. But, you know, people are different. I think the tracksuit is absolutely banging. I'd wear the fuck out of that tracksuit. Let's not, you know, mince any words. Get familiar on the back of the t-shirt. Like the merch line is just incredible. Did they do the same thing for the Monarch pair? I'm not too sure, but these look so good. Let's continue. Um, have a Dutch. Da, da, da. This marks the fifth time the Netherlands imprint has lent its touch to the re, to the ever classic sportswear silhouette, and it makes a perfect sense to considering that this staple amongst the Bears of Amsterdam community. Yeah, I've still, oh man, I sold my Paris in it for a couple of grand, I think. The ones are like red with the plum or the. I, I regret selling those so much, man. I wonder how much those are going for nowadays. They're probably going for. A lot of money let me actually check actually on my phone i don't want to disturb my flipping finger see how much money those patter um air max ones that i had before are going for air max one patter let's see here uh stock x let's see because i had a particular pair oh, okay the ones i want the monarchs are only going for fucking 170 you guys are sleeping on these man that's such a good shoe absolutely insane it's going for so cheap isn't it actually let's let's see the actual size because it's a size five let's be calm my size yeah only 240 that's absolutely insane 240 the shoe that i want right so okay let's go for the other one see if we've got the other patterns ones here that's the one. Oh my god the shoe that i had right that i sold back in the day for like a thousand pound is now going for seven grand the Cherrywood Power that I had is going for 7K. That is legitimately one of the most wildest things I've seen. Um, let's see if view bids or view sales. Let's see if view sales. No sales available. Okay, so no one sold a pair in a size 10 in a while. Um, bid, 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 bid. Okay, let's see a nine. Oh my God, someone sold a, a seven for 13 grand and a 9.5 for nine. That's absolutely wild, man. Yeah, so if you type it in yourself and you see a para pata cherrywood um air max one then you'd know the one i had back in the day um let's just double check and see if there's not another one i had there obviously the green ones fifth anniversary they were pretty decent only going for what, a grand only a grand but yeah crazy isn't it oh these ones i had these oh my god i had these too so i had these as well they're called the nike these ones right i think i had two pairs of these as well two two pairs and i must have sold them for like a couple of grand and they're going for now if i go for sales any sales here someone sold a 11 in 2018 for two grand 2558 pounds so they went up a grand since i last bought them so it, they're still quite a decent investment if you have the money to buy these pairs of shoes and just keep them on ice wow my urahara's i wore the hell out of these ura 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 wow have you pronounce the word they say it Urawa, Urawa Air Max ones. I wore the hell out of my ones, right? 
and these guys are selling them for one grand. How can you? Why does it say sell your item for two hundred fifty nine? 49 but it says buy for that price it makes no sense does it let's view the sales okay someone bought them for 600 um in october just recently okay not too bad so you can get them for a pretty decent price but yeah big up let's move on for this one Trapping outside the shoes, a handful of apparel pieces, including a matching tracksuit and two tees, uh, adorned with the pattern branding and light side. Okay, I'm not gonna watch the video, it's two minutes, it's too long for that. Uh, da, da, da. it says your pattern is a pat Nike pattern you re re reunite once again to collaborate and deliver MX1, launching October 29th, um, and chapter two of the film series The Wave. The collaboration is a thematic reference to the cultural shift and enduring influence of pattern has had in the great community and industry in this four part film. Four part film. We're assuming there's going to be four colorways then. So we've already got the Monarch. We've already got this teal sort of like bluey color. And now we're going to have, I think maybe the purple that's been featured right at the top there. I showed you before. So it's going to be four colorways. Okay, interesting. Um, in chapter two, we follow a character, older sister of Abdul, a DJ producer called Carista. Okay, I didn't know she was from Holland. Uh, I guess so. I don't know that. Um, as she creates her own sanctuary, experimenting, collaborating with friends and peers, Carista, United Identities, learns that music is a universal language and she opens up her meeting expected unexpected people along the way. It says since I started making films of photography, uh, my work has always been about finding ways to show love to people that look like me. Pat are a great example of creativity and can manifest into authentic relationships for many young black and brown filmmakers. Steve McQueen and his legacy have been somewhat of a North Star for us to be able to collaborate. I'm proud to be working with Nike and Pat, a black owned community who have always been about supporting interesting black talent in bringing new emerging voices like Mali, Mali Nina. How do you say that? Ma. Mahanelia, Mahanelia, right? to the broader wider public to the exciting collaborations says Steve McQueen Steve McQueen helped to fucking collaborate with this Baba Ratted but yeah regardless um, check those guys out October 29th you're most likely not going to get a pair try anyway because it looks absolutely banging the tracksuit is probably even worth a cop just on the strength um, you could still get a pretty decent colorway similar to this to wear with the tracksuit even if you don't an all white pair of air maxes will go banging with this you know what i mean so it's still a vibe man and again four colorways to come out i guess this is going to be the third that one there that kind of purpley one at the top that they're sort of teasing us right they're just giving us a toe just a tip right no homes right just a tip pause on that one <laughs> they're just poking it in on there and that might be something you'll see very very soon so yeah big up Petter, big up them man soon come soon come in it um what else we talk about here yeah quickly give a shout out to my guy josh ravides because i worked with him previously at another company that i was working at doing some interesting stuff with some emerging brands and he was an absolute gent and i'm absolutely over the moon to see him doing so well um i think when we met him at the time he was going through a bit of a career change in terms of stopping his brand i've got the name of his brand he had at the time but then he kind of transitioned into being josh ravides which is a kind of his kind of artistic moniker sort of similar to what daniel arsham is doing with the stuff that he's did and he's doing installations he's doing you know collabs with different sort of brands outside of just the sneaker street we're seeing it's just great to see him kind of flourish and now he's supposed to be doing a collaboration with new balance with his signature style with the black outlines on the white body and i'm assuming this is definitely in part due to the new direction new balance usa is going in with the ami leon dior guy taking over um the you know creative director role whatever maybe your partner's just got the actual title so that's going to be looking forward to going forward um but we don't have any deals on the model um it says here following his monochromatic capture collection with xm collaboration with da bmw see just videos are doing big stuff bmw collaborations just videos on very late relationship with new balance as indicated on his Instagram account the neoclassic artist um, has previously teamed up with the likes of hundreds converse and fendi the recent post gives a little hint of the latest offerings with the utilization of the silhouette of the 5740 decorated la based graphic signature bold outlines and the project of a monochromatic hand drawn aesthetic over the cream base upper the black line detail da, 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 as indicated in the post just the videos five seven four will be set to launch on november 5th so no deals on what it actually looks like in hand but i'm assuming based on how he puts things together we can kind of figure that out so again november 5th check out joshua videos again like i said one of the 
proper gentleman when it comes to the streetwear industry um somebody who i would definitely um kind of kind of have a lot of good things to say about and somebody that i think definitely deserves all the success especially considering how much time he spent in the scene the different places he's worked at you know the, the dues he's paid again i hate that phrase dues paid i was told to do it once by one person who's a bit of a cunt so ever since i heard that kind of thing i kind of it bowled my piss but regardless he paid his dues he'd done his job um he kept performing he kept turning up and essentially he got the rewards and you know you can't hate on that so yeah big up just for videos new balance coming up soon november 5th november 5th um what else we got here to talk about da, 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 da. Mm -mm. what about that one um what else we got here Da, 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 da. We've got obviously yeah, a new club courtesy of Resident Advisor opening up in Bushwick, New York. I really want to go back to New York. Last time I went, 2013, 14, or something like that. Uh, first kind of lads holiday with a couple of my friends, um, a couple, more than a couple, it was like 14 people living in a hostel, sharing flipping Popeyes, eating, you know, eating subs drinking 40s in, in the park and shit madness but we loved it um this is here the new york club rash opens in bushwick the grand opening party takes place tonight at the with dj's shy boy renji yay spray on the bill happening oh it happened last week actually so that's already gone new clubs open in bushwick said after service of opening this month the venue called rash officially launches today with a grand opening the club will stay open seven days a week following the final grand opening continuing tomorrow with dj and drone um goth jafar machine girl who plays Celtic ugly and i like the fact that a lot of these clubs in new york have a very American centric sort of lineup. They kind of book a lot of domestic acts, sometimes a lot of local acts too. You think of Boston Nova Civic Club, they do a lot of good things there. I love the programming. It's really interesting. It kind of, again, reminds you of London in general. Like you go to kind of our kind of, you know, marquee venues for the most part, and they've always kind of trying to book people who are residents here instead of kind of going for the bait kind of outsiders and shit. It says the venue is located at 914 Willie. What's that? What's of it? Wilgaby neighborhood, neighborhoods at Marto Avenue, a lively ship which is currently home to established dance music venues at Boston Nova Civic Club, Mood Ring, and Market Hotel. Oh, awesome. It's all in the same area. That's brilliant. Great um, placement. So far, local talent has been the focus of the venue's programming, see I said, which includes um, Liam's, includes Monorex, Miss Parker, Jasmine Infantile, and new of the New World Disorder Collective. Sorry, Jasmine Infantini's Infa Infantini New World Disorder Collective. See the club's Instagram for more deals and check out the lineup below. But yeah, it looks fucking sick, man. Is that the door you have to go into, into this club? I'm already a fan of it. If that's the door you have to go into, you're already a fan. You have to mind the step. It's a big metal door. You have to bang on it probably and shit. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it straight away. I love that vibe. Let's just see what the Instagram is saying actually at the club. Let's see what it's saying. Let's see what Rash is saying right now places like rash then i come through and give you a rash what is it saying 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 come on let's load my son give me a vibe give me a signal what's it saying okay oh it looks bloody awesome doesn't it look at that i love the lighting i love that some of these clubs in New York again maybe it's a way that they design bars uh, they have this always they have this long bar that you can kind of stand and sit at and kind of have a drink and shit I've always loved this sort of layout of nightclubs where you have this sort of long thing and then towards the end you have the kind of dance floor area with the DJ booth I've loved that because if you want to just chill catch a vibe maybe try and you know pick up some chicks right you can do so here grab a drink whatever and then grab a cigarette da, 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 and come back in and dance right i love the ability instead of just being kind of caught if, if it's the other way around you kind of feel trapped that you can't go anywhere and then it also spoils the vibe of the dj and of the party if you just have the booth here it's your way around you know what I mean? so i love the fact that you walk in long bar bar seats serve tip your bartender have a good time banter da, 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 da. and if you see someone spicy walking in and around or they come to get a drink you can talk and then boom you can do your thing in it so that's awesome um got a little video here for the club called rash we're open today just three days ago it looks look at this absolutely beautiful Put a sound i see what this is sounding like <laughs> I'm 
man, is there nothing better than seeing clubs or bars in action, like full flow? There's something about me that I just love this shit. Maybe it's just my nightlife thing in me or the fact that I'm an absolute degenerate. But I love this vibe. I love just seeing people like this, man. This is why I missed that feature on fucking Instagram where you could kind of, you'd be, it could be a bit of a voyeur from afar and just kind of um, location search. No, do, yeah, is it location search? location or geotag instagram story so if someone tagged themselves in a certain location you could go through instagram stories of people uploading videos in that location and you could get real-time updates so you kind of live very carelessly through them and that was also always sick man but for some reason they took it away i love that That's some New York shit, man. Not gonna lie, that's some New York shit. So yeah, big up um, Rash, opening up now. It's in Bushwick, I think it's already open. From the looks of it, uh, they've got another lineup here. It looks like coming up when pre-sale for Friday night. So this week already, Devin Flax. Which how do you pronounce that? Is that Dead Boy, um, Angel Money, Dime, DJ Thank You, Knives. That little tag. He has awesome, so you can always tag. Check out their Instagrams. Nine four one Bully Bully. So hopefully that stays open for a while. Hopefully I can able to be able to visit very soon. It looks absolutely amazing. Love the place. Love the vibe. Good good location. Good logo. So hopefully they bring some merch. I wouldn't mind wearing it on the hat. I'm not gonna lie. Something Apex Twenty about the logo. I wouldn't mind wearing that logo on the hat. I'm not going to lie. Next on the list, um, what else do we have here? Boom, 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 boom. Dogecoin killer. No, it's a bit shit to talk about that. It's all right, it's, let's move on to this one. Uh, this is courtesy of um, a lady called Four Court Pumps, who's one half of the see the thing is podcast that's formerly on the joe budden network and it looks like they've just announced that this is going to be their final quote-unquote season on the joe budden podcast and they're going to podcast network or jump on the network and they're now going to move on to do their own thing and it's hilarious to me as a as a fan of joe budden and a fan of his podcast sort of rebirth um that this is sort of happening and things are kind of crumbling around him but it's also somewhat sad as well to see somebody who you kind of held up or i held up in such high esteem who i was hoping would be able to kind of reinvent himself and be able to have a new lease of life in the media space and again being thoroughly entertaining and be able to kind of build the network up into being a behemoth and kind of taking over shit and kind of challenging what sort of um charlemagne's doing with the black effect podcast or network or black effect network however you can however you call it but it looks like there's only one clear win into where he he's doing his things and where Joe's doing his things are completely different things so the announcement says as follows um we have wrapped up season one or see the thing is and in doing so we are departing from Joe Budden Network we will be independent moving forward this last year has been a wild one I want to also I'll thank everyone who's been along for the ride and those of you who are going to be uh the new to the nieces and nephews tribe we've grown to love eh? you call your fans nieces and nephews weird um no idea about that one um same show same attitude new home i am bridget kelly and i want to thank those who have supported us and growing the podcast network um a book podcast sorry and much thanks to joe budden ian parks save on um, whoever that person is and the entire joe budden network team da, 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 da. obviously people leaving heart eyes and messages and i think people were mainly kind of kind of eye opened the fact that Mar left a message and they replied to his and no one else's and shit. Whatever, yeah? Cool. Um it's funny. It's hilarious because you would imagine this would come off the back of the fact that Rory and Mar were able to get to the bag quite quickly, despite their podcast not being that great. Let's be honest. Even though we're fans of the show again, I'm fans of them. I'm happy they got the bag. I'm always going to be rooting for those guys because I think Joe was an absolute scumbag and um, when it comes to how he dealt with them. But the podcast isn't the greatest and they still got a pretty hefty bag. So if they can do it, these girls must be thinking, hey, our podcast isn't as bad. No, our podcast isn't maybe as good as the Dojo Button original podcast, but it's definitely good enough to get ourselves a little bag too. And again, two, you know, no, maybe one attractive young lady and another one's maybe super open about her sexual escapades it's gonna be easy probably for them to get a deal and find a new home somewhere. I would imagine so. And also, you don't leave a network like you don't leave a place without some sort of plan in mind so for sure they're going to pitch people they probably had meetings already but it's just hilarious that they're branding this as like a season one and season two we were never told there was going to be seasons um shows that do seasons anyway or podcasts are always a bit strange especially when it's not an actual episode you're sort of like show show it's just like a 
podcast you just ramble and talking to make sure to tell us a season just sounds bizarre but again i think it's branding and again you know they're probably doing this as maybe as a call to action let people know hey we are free we are doing our thing let's go but it's interesting on the joe Biden end of things that the one podcast that he kind of or the fact that he kind of started this network um with female-led shows despite there not being that many female listeners in in general i'd imagine of the joe Biden podcast was bizarre but also the fact that it felt like he did it more so because he wanted to try and um rewrite the narrative that existed out there during the time that he was a little bit you know he had some very bad relations with women so in order to kind of rewrite that narrative let's host or let's get all these women-led podcasts on my network so people don't think i'm a piece of shit and it clearly didn't work because what ended up happening in true Joe Biden fashion, he ended up self imploding and he ended up causing his own issues so much so to go to the point where he brings on these female podcasts to kind of rehabilitate his image with the Shade Room Collective, right? Or, the, or with the Shade Room Sisters. That doesn't go to plan because he ends up, you know, allegedly sexually assaulting one of the co hosts of this show, former co hosts. Um, who then kind of comes out with the complaint. And then these two girls who are about women empowerment decide to back up Joe publicly and basically throw a smart on the name of their former co-host because they, they didn't like her. So imagine women, again, they were own worst enemies. They complain about men, but usually it's women doing shit to each other. Joe allegedly sexually assaults their former co-host, but because they don't like her, they willingly kind of excuse his behavior because it's going to allow them to do the show on their own, right? And because they just don't like her in general. So they kind of had a dog in the race in terms of Joe. That ends up essentially scuppering any opportunities Joe had in terms of getting deals in because Square, because it cash up or one of those uh, uh, sponsors walked away, which definitely is going to affect the ability to him to pay other people on the network, which may also affect their ability to maybe bring in sponsorships on being part of the network itself. Because I don't know how it works. I don't know if the business, if I don't know if the behind the scenes is you sign up, you get, you know, you get tech and shit. Maybe you have to pay a sub. I don't know how it works. And maybe the deals that you bring in, you keep for yourself. But whatever they generate on their channel, they keep. I don't know how it works. I don't know. Don't ask me. But maybe there's something in it. The fact that the Patreon was separate. The fact that he never promoted the show. He never kind of brought them on his show. Like It was just a weird way to promote a network. It didn't make any sense. Essentially, a lot of people have said it and made the same point. It was never a network. It was just a YouTube channel that had different shows on it. And again, none of these shows were established. They just kind of tried to start them from the ground up. Maybe his biggest success has been, see the thing is, the other one, girl, I guess, is complete failure now, especially off the back of Karen Civil's, you know, scammy ways, allegedly. Again, scammy ways. But this has definitely been the biggest success out of all of them. Maybe you could argue that, you know, the the, the Rory and Moore show came out of the Joe Biden but not really. Do you know what I mean? That was basically them being put into a corner and trying to kind of uh, figure stuff out on the fly. But it again, it should have always been um, maybe something of a sports. I think a lot of people have made this point. Maybe there should have been something of a sportsy type of relationship -y type podcast with maybe a couple of girls, a couple of guys to kind of, you know, lean into the demographic that they already have. Maybe a music review show like something but bringing two female-led shows of this ilk with such i would say divisive personalities in Kyra and civil and this girl for Kurt pumps like i'm not really a fan of her i think she's a bit of a garbage human personally just from what i've seen online um not really a fan at all so they're already of their two turn-offs on two shows and two halves of you know of the show too who kind of carry it and kind of lead conversations so if you can't listen to them because you don't like their personality how are you going to listen to the show do you know what I mean? so it's like that wasn't necessarily the best idea and just you know again the way he shit on these friends i think if you're on the network you have to take notice again i think a lot of those, a lot of blame could be put at the feet of rory and mall you know business-wise and what they did and essentially they basically went into business with joe thinking he fucked over all these other people and he's not gonna do it to me because we're friends and he ended up doing it to him because they're friends so if you're somebody on the network who isn't a close friend of joe's just a professional acquaintance you have to kind of be objective and be quite cutthroat about how you approach it be like nah i can't let this go i can't be the guy that kind of gets stuck in this position so i need to make a move and they did they made a move and here they are and um hopefully it works out for them and they're able to get to the bag um again i don't listen to the show don't care about it haven't listened to one full episode i think ever since maybe rory's show but again it's a great illustration that maybe from all the things joe said about business and you know the corporations and vo culture vultures and shit 
from what we've seen so far, everyone has been able to walk away from Joe intact has been able to get to some sort of bag he would obviously take credit for some of it but essentially we get to the point where we might say you know what maybe he's the problem maybe it's not these big corporations maybe it's not spotify maybe it's not barstool maybe it's not all these places maybe he actually is the issue in terms of not being able to get you know bags for himself and secure deals and stuff because like i said again i'm not a fan of the guy anymore i think he's a piece of shit but i still think someone of his of his ilk definitely deserves um, what you call it definitely deserves a a bag definitely deserves some compensation some recognition of the work that he's done of the blueprint that he laid um in being able to do this thing in this sort of urban market when it comes to podcasting and media and all that stuff like he's definitely laid the blueprint no one can say he hasn't or he's definitely played an instrumental part in allowing people to know how to maneuver and how to figure stuff out and be conscious of deals and all this so even though he didn't practice it himself the, he, still the awakening is good enough and i think for that alone you should be able to get something you know from it i'm sure he's still making good money from it now but still it should be more do you know what i mean for the for the work he's done but again this might be karma you know what i mean you can't fuck over your friends in public like that and expect strangers to also want to work with you it just doesn't work do you know what i mean and the narrative's got a bit weird it's just it's just a bad move for him in general but hey again what do i know wishing all those see the thing see the thing is girls luck and hope they're able to secure the bag on their way to the top and i think i think I think I'm gonna have to end it there, right? What time is it now? I think I've wasted a lot of your time. I don't wanna be rambling on and on and on for too long. Oh yes, yeah, one hour twenty, come on. Let's end it there. So one hour twenty minutes of the excellent Zinger show. Thanks for tuning in as per usual. It's been great to have your company. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, make sure you hit that like and subscribe down below. Much appreciate if you're listening via the podcast app. Please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. That'd be greatly appreciated. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome to at patreon.com for just Agostino. Get involved on there today. Don't delay. Patreon.com for just Agostino. Little as one dollar equivalent to one pound per day or per month, sorry, per day. You get access to my entire bonus arsenal no content so make sure you jump on there get involved and i can't wait to see you again soon take care be safe peace